Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our second Revisions webinar. We are running a series of these webinars throughout the course of the year, with the objective being to keep you updated on various aspects of the revision. We believe it is important to continually keep you informed as things progress. I'm Mark Bullstone, Client Propositions Manager, and I'm going to facilitate this webinar today. In addition to myself, we have two BSI experts who will be talking you through the two main areas. Angela Grant, who is Head of Professional Development, who will be talking you through the new high-level structure, and Tim Sperry, Tutor Delivery Manager, who will be giving an overview of the changes to both ISO 9001 and ISO 14001. So the key areas we will cover today are an overview of the new high-level structure, also known as Annex SL, as well as an overview of the changes to both 9001 and 14001. So I would now like you to, to hand over to Andrew, who will talk you through the new high-level structure. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Grant, and as Mark said, I'm Head of Professional Development at BSI. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through the high-level structure. This is also known as Annex SL. There are now many management system standards designed to help a business function more effectively, such as ISO 9001, ISO 14001 and OSAS 18001. There are standards for anti-bribery and collaborative relationships, to name but a few. And many of these standards are written in different formats and structures which makes it very difficult for organisations to integrate these standards together. So the ISO committee thought it would be a good idea to create a standard for writing management system standards. And this is called Annex SL. And it's also referred to as the high level structure. So this high level structure has common terms and definitions with a core set of requirements and will be applied to all new and revised management system standards. So for management system implementers, this will provide an overall management system framework so you can then add specific discipline um, standards into those requirements. So what are the benefits of this, this high level structure? Well, this means that before a standard is even issued, you will have an understanding of the core elements. It will save time and make it easier to implement and remove any conflicts and duplication and confusion from different management system standards. So in future, all ISO management system standards should be consistent and compatible. Annex SL harmonises structure, text and terms and definitions while leaving the standard developers with the flexibility to integrate their specific technical topics and requirements. The high level structure, that is the major clause numbers and titles, cannot be changed. However, sub clauses can be added and you will see this further on in the session in relation to 9001 and 14001. Already some of our standards are already harmonised to Annex SL, such as 22301, which is the standard for business continuity. So, what does the standard look like? Well, the high level structure now has 10 clauses in total. And we're now going to go through the detail of these clauses. You can see in the screen now the first three clauses of the standard. And it's really important that you read the standard from the very beginning. Please don't be tempted to skip to the detailed clauses because these first three clauses include, include some important information. Clause one covers the intent. So the purpose of this is to succinctly define the subject and the purpose of the management system. So it also indicates the limits of the applicability of the standard. The second section is normative references. And this makes reference to any um, reference documents which have been cited in the management system standard in such a way as to make it indispensable for the application of the standard. 
So for example, in 9001 and 2008, ISO 9000, which is fundamentals and vocabulary, is referenced in this section. And section 3 covers the terms and definitions. So this section will cover the harmonised terms and definitions for all management system standards. As I mentioned earlier, one of the, the benefits of the high level structure are common terms and definitions. So the ones that you see on screen here, you may already be familiar with. So for example, top management is one that is already within the existing standards. But documented information is a new definition in the standard. So this means information which is required to be controlled and maintained in an organisation. And this includes the requirements from previous standards uh, for records and documents. So these are the remaining clauses of the standard. As I mentioned before, there are 10 clauses in total. And this is what all new and revised management system standards will look like. The, as I mentioned before, the standards, specific standards may add in some additional um, sub-clauses into <coughs> these clauses. You will notice here that in section 8 there is very little in this section and this is because this is the clause of the standard which will differ most from standard to standard. The high level structure and therefore all of the standards are based, based on the Plan Do Check Act model. As well as this having an overall view throughout the whole standard, so for example Clause 5 and Clause 6 is the planning clause. Section 7 and Clause 8 is the doing clause. Clause 9 is the checking clause. And Clause 10 is the act clause. However, it's important to mention that you all should all apply the Plan Do Check Act model to all the processes of the standard. So, for example, for your management review process, you should plan that process, you should carry out your management review, check how effective it is, and then take any actions to improve this process. Now let's look at clause four. So the context of the organisation is about knowing the business environment that you are operating in. And the reason why this is important is because organisations need to be ready to respond to any risks that are in the business environment or any opportunities that are in the business environment also. The business landscape for many organisations change very rapidly, so you must continually to look out to your business landscape to see what is changing and how this will affect you. And you would do this by identifying your interested parties, understanding what they need in relation to the purpose of the standard or the standards that you're using, and then any identify any issues which may impact your organisation either from a positive or negative approach. So for example, you may adopt the PESL approach to identify these issues. Clause 5 looks at leadership, the requirements of leadership. And this is really important because management systems will only work if they're truly embedded within an organisation. So this is one of the things that this clause is trying to achieve. And that's why it's really important that top management drives this within the organisation. So remember, top management is a person or group of people who direct or control at the highest level in the organisation and relates to the scope of your management system standard. You will see, for those who already work with management system standards and are familiar with the term management representative, this is now being removed from the standard. And again, this is a step to try and make sure that the management system standard responsibility is shared out with all the people within the organisation and not just down to one person in the organisation. Clause 6 is about identifying risks and opportunities in your organisation. So you will use the information from Clause 4 
in relation to the context of your organisation and the impacts of your business to identify these risks and opportunities. And risk-based thinking runs through the whole of the high-level structure and all the relevant standards. Section 7 looks, about, looks at all the support elements in the standard. So some of these things will already be familiar to you. For example, in previous standards that you work with, you'll be familiar with the importance of communication and awareness. But now the high-level structure takes this a further step forward. We now talk about engaging people in the organisation. And this is really important because research shows that in high-performing organisations, employees are engaged. And it's not only the employees, it's also about subcontractors and suppliers. So it's really important that managers engage people within their organisation so that they understand their contribution to the management system and what it's trying to achieve. You will also notice throughout the high-level structure some of the requirements are less prescriptive and documented information is one of these requirements. The it's the responsibility of the organisation to identify what documentation you need to support the operation of your processes and also to have the confidence that these processes are being carried out as planned. We'll not take much time talking about Clause 8, as because I mentioned earlier, from standard to standard, this is where um, the, the requirements will change most. And you'll see a lot of sub-clauses added as you go into the detail of each standard requirement. So let's move on to Clause 9. Clause 9 looks at performance evaluation. So this focus is on the output of what you are doing with the information. This section not only looks about what you should be monitoring and measuring, it also looks at the methods you use and when you should monitor and measure. And just as importantly, when you should analyse and evaluate this information. This clause also includes the requirements for internal audit and management review, which I'm sure you'll already be familiar with. And finally, clause 10 is all about improvement. This, set, this clause breaks down the requirements for correction and corrective action, which have been a problem before in previous standards. And it's also worth just reminding ourselves about the definition of continual improvement. Continual improvement is a recurring activity to enhance performance. So I appreciate that's a quick step through the requirements of the HELP high level structure, but hopefully you will have an understanding of its requirements. And I would like, now like to hand over to Tim who's now going to take you through and give you an overview of ISO 9001 and ISO 14001. Thank you as well, Janet. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Sperry, and I'm the Tutor Delivery Manager for the UK for BSI. I'm going to take you through some of the key changes that are proposed to happen with ISO 9001 and 14001. Starting with 14001. Now, it's important that we get to action quite early. This is why we've been building up our webinars and our live shows uh, for, for several months now. So following on from out of the slides, um, I'll be talking through the main changes relating to the main clauses of ISO 14001. What you'll see on the screen now are the key areas of the standard where we see some key changes. We're starting with leadership and starting with the context of the organisation. As Angela mentioned, that's something that comes directly from the high-level structure. And it's something that we need to understand within our organisations, actually what makes us tick, what our organisations comprise of. We also need to identify um, where we have some opportunities to improve, but also threats that might be facing us as well. Those threats that are facing us, and potentially the opportunities, we need to then understand 
what the risk levels are within those opportunities and within those threats. By understanding fully the context of our organisation, we should be able to understand more clearly what our aspects are and more clearly how those aspects may impact upon the environment. If we don't understand the organisational context fully, what we'll end up doing is not identifying all of our aspects and potential impacts, and also not identifying these threats and opportunities that are facing us. So it's a very, very good in, uh, improvement we see to 14001 uh, coming from the high-level structure, as it will help us to understand fully how our business ticks and how we need to manage our potential impacts on the environment. There's also a greater emphasis on the integration of the environmental management system with the strategic direction of the organisation. All organisations, whether large, medium or small, have direction and they have a strategy. The strategy may be for growth, the strategy may be for retention of customers, it may be to diversify into new markets. The management system should be part of that strategic direction of the organisation and certainly not something that is separate. If we have something that's separate, what we end up with is a management system that sits on a shelf that does not integrate with the business itself. We see here that with, within leadership, we should be looking for more visible and more active integration of leadership within the management system itself. There's a greater emphasis on top management demonstrating their leadership and demonstrating the way that they interact with the management system itself. Some of the more key changes are the enhanced environmental management system planning so that we can actually manage those risks that are associated with the threats and the opportunities. If we consider a risk that we've identified that we're not managing, that risk itself could lead to a negative impact on the environment. It could lead to legal non-compliance, but it could lead to upset neighbours, customers, or it could lead to even prosecution. We'll see from the standard that preventive action has been replaced by risk. Preventive action is one of those phrases that's often misunderstood, and it really means that it's identifying potential threats to the business and identifying how we are going to manage those potential threats. We also have processes being much more explicit within the organisational structure and within the management system. In terms of process management, it identifies not only the activities, but the processes that are involved in terms of how those processes are managed, that's how we identify resources for those activities, how we identify the required inputs, but certainly the required outputs of those processes, so that we can then identify the chain of events within our organisations to hopefully reduce our negative impact and improve our positive impact upon the environment. We can also see that the life cycle perspective has now been included. This allows us to focus on the whole journey of the product or service uh, with the aim of reducing negative impacts on our environment. In terms of the life cycle perspective, it doesn't mean that we have to do a life cycle analysis or an assessment of every single process or activity, but we need to identify those that have a journey where we can identify that journey that is within our control that we can then manage and reduce the impact upon the environment. We also have a common term now which talks us through documented information. Previously we'll see in the current version of 14001. Documented information is in the form of records and in the form of procedures. In the proposed new version of 14001, there is only one reference to procedure. Everything else is talking about processes. Now this doesn't mean to say that there is no requirement now to keep records. Of course we'll need to keep records. Customers will require them, legislation will require them, and your business will require them. 
So records will still be, uh, need to be maintained to ensure that we can demonstrate compliance to legal, customer and also our own business requirements. In terms of the key changes to the standard, there are some of the changes coming from some of the common terms and definitions. <coughs> These are just some of the changes that were not defined in the current version of 14001 and some of the differences that are within the new version. So going down the right hand side, documented information as I mentioned here. Documented information is still going to be built up from procedures or process flow diagrams and records. But it's been turned into one definition to help us manage information within the organisation more effectively. We see compliance obligation. This tells us that we have obligations that are not just compliance with legal requirements, but also other requirements that come from customers. They come from uh, local authorities, maybe pressure groups, maybe neighbours, or maybe the local community. Widening out the current phrase of legal and other requirements to compliance obligation helps us to identify more obligations that we have within our business and within our environmental management system so that we can then look to comply with all of those obligations that we have. Now, it doesn't mean to say that you have to identify every single thing and then say that you're going to comply with all of them. Some organisations may choose not to comply with certain obligations. Those obligations may be simple um, local pressure groups or maybe community ideas. Certainly if it comes down to legal requirements and the requirements of the management system and the business, you have no choice. You certainly want to comply with those obligations. There's also some other terms here that we've mentioned, such as environmental condition, process, top management, life cycle and risk. All of those are now more clearly defined within the new version of 14001. So in summary for 14001, the key changes that we see come from the high level structure and it's allowed the ISO and the committee that have developed the new standard to consolidate a lot of the existing information, but also to create some greater clarity for the new version of 14001 to help us in organisations to effectively manage our environmental impacts. I'm going to move on now to some of the key changes in ISO 9001. So in terms of some of the key changes that we'll see, what we'll see is now more generic approach to the management system uh, using the high level structure. It's now much more generic in terms of its compatibility with service industries. There's been a, a long debate amongst ISO 9001 users as to whether it truly is effective or useful for service industries. I myself have only ever worked in service industries and I've always found it extremely useful. And extremely useful in terms of helping structure an organisation and the way that we manage our customer relationships. But in terms of the new version, or the proposed version, of ISO 9001, what we're now talking about is wherever it says product, it will also say service. So it's products and services that we provide. Most organisations that are manufacturers also provide a service. So it's now more generic and more easy to use. As with 14001, as I mentioned, the organisation uh, must identify the context. So the organisational context must be understood to ensure that we identify all of our processes and so that we can manage all of our internal and our external opportunities and threats. Similarly with 14001, as Angela mentioned with the high level structure, risk now plays a big part in the makeup of ISO 9001. It's clearly telling us that we need to identify what makes our business tick through the organisational context. We need to identify the potential threats, the opportunities we have, so that we can then manage those through a risk-based approach, so that we can hopefully improve 
the level of service that we're providing to our internal customers and to our external customers. In terms of the process approach that we see at the top of the screen here, the process approach has been enhanced even further in the 2015 version to ensure that we are not just focusing on activities in isolation, but ensure that we're focusing on the organizational processes and the systems that are made up of those processes to ensure that we're also managing the links between one step within a process and the next step. So often known as a handoff between departments or between people, the process approach needs to be clearly managed within the organization so that we reduce the risk of things going wrong or reduce the risk of non-conformity. As with 14,001, preventive action has been replaced by the phrase risk. It, it's no requirement to do a full risk assessment of all of your processes, as we see from the new version of 9001. But there is a requirement to identify the things that could damage the organisation things that are threatening the organisation, but also the opportunities to improve the way that we're managing our processes so that we can do some form of risk measurement or risk checking or even risk analysis so that we can identify the way that we're going in to improve our organisational processes. Documented information, as I mentioned with 14001, is now more clear. It helps us to identify that we, we will require procedures, but also records within our documented management system, records to demonstrate that something has happened, and procedures or work instructions to help us to identify how things should be done for consistency and to ensure that we meet the requirements of our customer. One of the key changes also to 9001 is there are now no stated clear requirements for documented procedures. The current version requires six as a minimum. The new version of the standard does not mandate which procedures you choose to document. So again, looking back to the risk-based approach, what it's telling us within the new standard is we identify where there's a potential gap in knowledge, a potential gap in information sharing, or a potential gap in a process it could fail if we don't have an instruction to the operator or to the user. So using this risk-based approach when it comes to documented information will help us to clearly identify where we need documents, where we need to pass on information, and also the format for the information that we pass on in terms of procedures or process flows, or maybe videos, or even storyboards. We also, as in 14001, need to control externally provided products and services often known as purchasing or outsourcing. If we're outsourcing part of our business, part of our processes, maybe to a delivery organisation, maybe to some home workers, we need to ensure that the quality of that service or those goods that are provided is in line with our business strategy, in line with our big business aims, and also our objectives and customer needs. In terms of the quality management system principles. Currently, within ISO 9000, we have eight management principles. We can see some good changes to the new version of ISO 9000 in terms of the quality management pr principles. Customer focus is still there. That's to ensure that we focus on the needs of our customers, not just now, but also the potential future needs of our customers so that we do some form of horizon scanning to identify what our customers want and whether we can actually provide that in the future for them. Leadership, as I mentioned, has been enhanced to ensure that there's visibility of leadership and also that leadership demonstrate their full commitment, their active participation with the quality management system and how it links with the strategic direction of the organisation. Involvement of people has changed to engagement of people. This now widens up this management principle to ensure that we're not just involving people, but we're engaging them to become decision makers, maybe engaging them to become part, more participative in the management system itself. 
Process approach and systems approach have now been combined into one principle. This now helps us to fully understand that processes themselves form part of a system. Our business has systems. Our entire management system should be working with our business rather than being something separate. So thinking of this approach in terms of having systems approach to management and the process, combined, process approach combined helps us to now identify a much more structured way of managing our business using the systems approach. Continuing improvement has been proposed to change to improvement. There's always been a little bit of debate around continual or continuous improvement. So to make it more clear, the phrase improvement is now going to be used or proposed to be used in the new version of ISO 9001. The previous management principle of factual approach to decision making has now changed to an evidence-based decision making principle. We gather information through the monitoring, the measuring of our organization's activities. We then analyze that information to provide us evidence. That evidence we can then use to make decisions on how we can improve the way that we're managing things, the way that we're right managing relationships, or even managing our internal processes. So rather than just taking facts, we're now looking for an evidence-based approach to help us clearly make structured, strategic business decisions in line with our objectives and also in line with the context of our organisation. Mutually beneficial supply relationships has now been reduced to relationship management. Although the phrase itself is reduced, it actually widens out the relationship now to include potential partners rather than just people that are supplying to our organisation. Many organisations are now using a standard such as 11,000 for relationship management within their organisations. So they have these partnership approaches with other organisations. So rather than just considering that we have suppliers and we have customers, we need to manage the relationships within the organisation to ensure that we have a full understanding of the way that we manage these relationships. So I've now taken you through some of the key changes to ISO 9001 and to 14001. I'm now going to pass you back to Mark, who's going to take you through the way that we can support you within BSI. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Andrew and Tim, for that. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone online would have reaped some real benefits from that. So we realised that a lot of businesses will already be thinking about the transition and how they will be affected, what they will be doing and when. But we want to ensure our customers that we will support them every step of the way. Just prior to that, I just want to make sure that you are aware of the current ISO timescales. I must emphasise that these may change as they have done many times since the beginning of the process. Looking at the dates here, the FDIS for ISO 14001 is expected late June, early July, and the FDIS for 9001 will follow shortly after. Both revisions are currently on track to be published in September. Something to note here, there will be some benefits for those businesses with both standards to go through the transitions for ISO 9001 and 14001 at the same time. We will be producing a white paper on this subject in the next few weeks. So please keep an eye on the BSR website. A number of our standards are waiting for updates on some of the industry-specific quality standards. We can now confirm that AS9100 for aerospace and TS16949 for the automotive industry will be brought in line with ISO 9001-2015, and both are due to be published next year. ISO 13485, quality management for the pharmaceutical industry, is due to publish in December this year. We don't have a date for the FDIS at the moment, and it is possible that it will go straight from DIS to publication. We'll update you as soon as we know more. We'll soon be able to update you on the progress of ISO 45001. It will be some time before dates are confirmed for public drafts, but ISO is still hoping to publish a revised standard towards the end of 2016. And finally, for those of you that are working through ISO 27001-2013, this is the most recent ISO standard to be revised. So please note that you must have completed your transition 
by 1st of October this year. So what's next? Well, it may be some time before the revised standards are published, and three years seems like a long time to make the changes. But we know from experience that businesses who don't begin the process until the second or third year into the transition period typically struggle to have a smooth transition. From our perspective as a certification body, we are asking our customers to engage with us sooner rather than later, so that we can both help you plan, but also manage the resource that we need to ensure all of our customers have a successful transition. This is particularly critical with both ISO 9001 and 14001 due to be published so close together. Attending webinars such as this one will ensure that you are aware of what the changes look like, but we also have a variety of different information available through our website, so please continue to visit our website as more information is put on. And finally, please keep in touch with us. Your client managers will be happy to talk to you, but we also have a dedicated customer service team in place to take your questions. Thank you very much for listening to us. I'm sure you will have reaped some real benefits from this. I'd now like to move on the questions that have come in. We have had a lot of questions come in. Um, Andrew and Tim are online, so I'll be asking them to be input into these questions. So the first one from Michelle, thank you Michelle, is how do you start implementing the changes against the old standard? Okay, so in terms of implementation of the changes, if you're currently using the, uh, the current version of 14001 or ISO 9001, the best thing to do is to identify um, some form of gap analysis. Now we've got some really good tools that are being created and being published on our 9000 and 14001 transition websites. So take yourself to those websites, have a look at the white papers and have a look at the information that we've got on there and start yourself a gap analysis to identify what you have already got in place. You might surprise yourself that actually you've already got a lot of this information in place, but it may not be structured. So in short, a gap analysis is the way to start. Can I just add to that, Tim? I think it's important to also to remember that both ISO 9001 and 14001 are still in draft. So some of these requirements may change so just keep that in mind when you're carrying out your gap analysis. However, one thing that you can be sure of is that the requirements of the high level structure will not change. So definitely you know that you can conduct a gap analysis against those requirements. Thank you, Andrew and Tim. Our next question is from Lee. Um, we currently have an integrated management system covering 9001 and 13485. With the upcoming changes in both standards, do you believe an integrated system is feasible in the future? Lee, that's a really good question. Unfortunately, the revision of 13485 had already started prior to the publication of Annex SL. So it hadn't actually followed the, the structure um, of the, the high level structure. And it's not yet been confirmed whether they are going to revise what they had already written to align with the high level structure. So we, we don't actually know for this, this current version whether it will align or not. However, we, will, we do know that for the next version it definitely will have to align with the high level structure. So it might, it might be a bit more difficult in this current version if they don't decide to align it, but it certainly will align together um, when the next version of 13485 is published. Thanks, Angela. Our next question is from Timothy, and he has asked from slide 10, what is the PESEL approach? So the, the PESEL approach is, um, P, P stands for political, E stands for environment, um, C, S stands for social, the T stands for technological, the L stands for legal, and the E stands for economic. And you'll, you'll be able to look that up on, on the internet. It's quite a widely known approach. Thanks, Angela. Just adding into that as well for a little bit more background on it, it's, it's a very well used and very, uh, very good method of identifying all the potential threats that are facing us. Using the PESEL approach uh, ensures that we take ourselves outside of the business and think about society, think about um, the environment, 
the economic impacts, as well as also just thinking internally. Thanks very much for that. Thank you, Tim. Our next question has come in from Colin. In ISO 9001, there's no mention of the reordering of requirement clauses 8.2 to reflect the way business has changed. Tim, do you have any comments on that? In terms of the way the business has changed, this has now uh, been moved towards the earlier parts of the standard. So it's now being moved in terms of the planning elements. There is a clear requirement within this proposed version of 9001 that change must be managed. Rather than just reacted to, we need to plan for change. So if we know that we've got a new product or a new service that's going to come online in 2016, rather than just hoping for the best, we should actually be planning the way that we're managing our processes, planning the way that we're managing our interaction with the customers, planning the way that we're managing our own production, production and service provision. So it's, it's now more clearly stated within the earlier elements of 9001, all the way up in section five of the planning element. Thank you, Tim. Further question is from Alan, and his question is, why isn't Annex SL being made a standard in its own right? I'm going to pass this across to Angela. Yeah, this is an interesting question, Alan. Annex SL was, is the, the actual requirements that we're going through today, it's part of a, a much bigger document, and it really is a, a guidance document for the standard writers on how they should write standards. So it was never its intention that it should be used by people who implement those requirements. However, if you actually, if you buy a copy of um, the draft version of 9001, for example, you'll be able to see that the, the high-level structure requirements are written in blue and the additional 9001 requirements are written in black. So actually from that document, you'll be able to see um, the requirements of the high-level structure, but you can actually purchase it as a separate document. Thanks, Angela. Our uh, next question is from Claudio. What role will auditors have to audit and make statements on compliance, especially re re regulatory requirements? Okay, thanks for that question. In terms of the uh, regulatory requirements and legal requirements that we're facing within the organisation, auditors realistically should already be identifying, certainly within 14001 where there are legal requirements that we need to manage and then uphold within the organisation. And auditors play a key role in assessing whether we meet the requirements of said legislation. Now, in terms of widening this out to 9001, there's also a requirement that's coming through within the new version to ensure that we meet all of the obligations that are not just customer or not just business related, but also legal related. So in terms of auditor skills, something that we've already started implementing within our own training courses of our own staff, and also the commercial training courses that we manage, is to ensure that people understand when they're auditing, they also need to look at legal requirements as a potential threat or a potential opportunity that we can then assess during our audits to identify whether we meet them or not. So in short, it's, it's basically business as usual for those that are already auditing against the legal requirements. But for those that are not, they need to get themselves up to speed and ensure that they are auditing against those requirements. Just going to pass you over to Angela who's got something to add. Yeah, just, just to add on to that, I think it's important just also to say that certainly when we're conducting third party audits, we are not making a statement in relation to your compliance with legislation. What we are assessing is your conformity with the requirements against the standard and the systems that you have in place to make sure that you remain legally compliant. Fantastic. Thanks again, Andrew and Tim. Okay, our next question is from Steve. With these changes, is there a benefit to an organisation with ISO 9001 14001 and 18001, introducing PAS 99 at this stage? I can give you a very, very short answer to that, and the short answer is yes. Absolutely. Um, we had a question earlier on about why is Annex SL not a published document. Um, as Angela clearly stated, it's something that's being used by committees to help them to create standards. But PAS 99, publicly available specification number 99, has been rewritten with the new high-level structure within it. And I would certainly um, 
take the steps to use PAS99 to help you to integrate your management systems more effectively. Fantastic. So thank you very much for attending this webinar and we are sure you've got a lot out of it. We will be holding further webinars in the future and as you've come onto this one we'll make sure you're totally aware of it. Thank you.